So what neurological developmental disability stands for, um, it just kind of affects the development of the person's brain, which in turn results in the um, environmental stimuli being part of the symptomology, um, difficulty in language processing and communication, and then understanding those kind of communicative um, awareness skills, so forming relationship bonds that we talked about in the previous slides. Um, so there is <coughs> evidence um, that genetics and um, heredity could have something to do with um, the causation of autism with identical twin studies. Um, if one twin is diagnosed with autism, then in turn, the other twin will also be diagnosed with autism, um, but that is only in identical twins. So with that um, evidence, they are trying to relate genetics and um, family studies with heredity. Um, there are often linking cases where if one person in your family has autism, it's common that other members in your family will also have autism, kind of running through the bloodline type of thing. Um, similar to other diseases or disabilities, so if you have diabetes, for example, um, say a mother has diabetes, it's, you have a higher chance of your daughter then also having diabetes, that kind of correlation there, but nothing definitive or anything. They're still conducting studies. So as studies have been conducted in the past, while we don't know um, many examples of what does cause it, we do know several examples of what does not cause it, such as all of those listed on the left. But um, as teachers and parents, support staff, or anyone working with the children or the child that has autism, it's not our job to focus on the cause, but our job to evaluate and treat the symptoms and behaviors based on what we can see and observe. So the causation is kind of irrelevant. So moving on to prevalence and who can acquire or have autism. Um, prevalence is the number of cases of a condition that exists at a particular time in a defined population. So as of 2008, um, approximately 188 children have been identified with an autism spectrum disorder. Going off of that, um, it is about five times more common among males, 154, than females, which is 1 in 252. And you'll see that correlate in your classrooms. There are usually more boys in an autistic support classroom than ladies. Um, who can have autism? Autism spectrum disorder has been reported to occur in all, all types of people. Um, all different types of race, all ethnicities, and all socioeconomic groups. So it does not discriminate against girls or boys, black or white, poor or rich, and it does not exclude anyone. It is also considered an invisible disability, since there's no definitive brain scan test that you can perform on someone to determine, oh, okay, he has autism because I scanned his brain and I saw this. Um, there is no test that shows that their brains look similar to ours. Um, and with that being said, by looking at someone, you could be completely unaware that they have autism. Um, it's whenever you observe their behavior, when you start to notice their idiosyncrasies. So um, and what that means is their peculiar or eccentric behavior. Um, so for example, I have two pictures posted above. Um, and they're both farmers, or both people that enjoy cows. Um, one of them has autism, but by looking at the pictures, you would never understand which one has autism. They are both looking into the camera, they both have the same kind of smirk on their face, and they're both kind of surrounded by a farm in the background. Um, the person on the left is Temple Grandin. She is a person who has autism, who actually started her own business, involving the care for farm animals, specifically cows. And the person on the right is just a random farmer that I found on Google. So just a little example. And you need to remember that when you're dealing with 
children who have autism. I mean, they have different symptoms, they symptomology, they have different behaviors, but they're just kiddos like everyone else. Okay, so some of the characteristics and symptomology associated with autism is what I already have mentioned, um, social development and impaired communication. Since autism is pervasive in nature, um, people with autism are profoundly impacted by the difficulty to understand how to communicate with others. It is extremely pervasive. So even in their best attempts to interact with others, it still can look very different from typical interactions, even though they are trying their best. They just don't have that realization of what is appropriate, um, what is inappropriate. Oftentimes, there is a lack of eye contact um, when communicating or just in general. The impaired ability to understand and maintain reciprocal interaction. So, um, taking turns and playing a game, um, two-person play. So, um, in a preschool room, for example, whenever two kiddos are kind of supposed to play with each other, um, share a toy, have that type of interaction, maybe pretend play. Um, they have the impaired ability to do that, so kind of um, not many examples of that happening in someone who has autism. The impaired or lack of ability to uh, communicate, um, initiate, and maintain a conversation. Um, as I've mentioned before, if they are unable to know um, what maybe when it's appropriate to start a conversation, um, when it's appropriate to continue aspects of the conversation. So maybe when you say hi to someone, they'll say hi back, and you'll say, how are you today? They'll just say good instead of knowing the social response to then ask the person how they are as well. Um, impaired understanding and use of nonverbal communication. Um, so with their eye gaze, facial expressions, and gestures. Sometimes they will exhibit um, different facial expressions that are unusual and different gestures, but also whenever others around them, so maybe their teachers, their parents, or even a friend is trying to communicate with facial expressions such as winking or smiling or hand gestures, they won't kind of, they won't understand what that person is trying to communicate to them through those facial expressions or those hand gestures. So for example, if you're holding up a hand um, to say high five, oftentimes a person with autism wouldn't realize that you're wanting to give them a high five and kind of just stare at your hand. Continuing with more characteristics, um, there's a lack of verbal and nonverbal acts. So um, sometimes to bring an object to someone, they will lack the ability to do that, um, to show or point out things of interest, um, or in conversation to show or point, um, since they lack the communication skills, sometimes people will use picture cards or objects around the room and ask their students to point to it or show them what they want, um, or when you're asking a question, um, like a comprehension um, question, for example, when you're reading, you can use pictures. Um, sometimes they'll lack even the ability to point to which picture answers the question you're asking. But um, when you are using that type of intervention to hold a conversation or complete questions, that is called declarative pointing. Oftentimes they will exhibit ritualized language when interacting, such as echolalia or scripting, which I'll talk about. Um, in another slide. Um, they have preference for routines and they also perseverate on things. So when you're perseverating on something, um, for example, a yellow ball, they'll kind of be obsessed with that ball, other things that bounce, other things that are yellow. Um, kind of like a, a small child when they're obsessed with a teddy bear, that kind of thing, except they can perseverate on numerous amounts of things. Sometimes dinosaurs in general, and so someone could know a lot of facts about dinosaurs, or um, that could be a reinforcer for them when they see a dinosaur. Anything providing them that type of happiness. Um, and then stereotypy or stimming. So stimming is a shortened word for self-stimulation. 
Um, it, it can be the repetition of physical movements, um, which can involve an object, um, or sound, um, repetition of sound. So along with that could be hand flapping, kicking, stomping, rubbing hands together, spinning, and multiple others. Um, sometimes people do these stereotypies or stimming um, events to use it as a calming and a joyful mechanism. So if they're experiencing some sort of anxiety, they could do this, um, an experience to their environment. So if they're experiencing hypersensitivity to an environmental stimuli, so say that the lights in the auditorium are too bright for them, they could experience um, stimming mannerisms, um, such as rubbing their eyes with their hands, rubbing their hands together and staring at their hands to kind of um, make their senses feel better or to focus on that sense. Um, and then sometimes they just do it to stimulate their own senses. If they're hyposensitive, they might do these types of behaviors because they need to feel extra things on their body. Going off of that last point on the slide are the sensory difficulties involved with autism. So like I mentioned a little bit before, Hypersensitivity is sensitivity to environmental stimuli, so when they're overwhelmed by the world around them and things that are happening in the world around them. When hyposensitivity is the opposite, um, and they're reinforced by environmental stimuli, so they're underwhelmed by the world around them, they need that extra touch, extra sound. Um, sometimes wearing a lot of clothes can add to that touch. Um, smelling a bunch of things can kind of um, interest them. So of our senses, sounds, and like I mentioned before, echolalia, which refers to the repetition of others' speech that may occur immediately after hearing a message or significantly later. So there is immediate echolalia, which refers to repeating a word or a phrase just spoken by another person. And in contrast, delayed echolalia, um, which is referring to the repetition of a word or phrase that was previously heard and is used at a later time out of context. So that could happen um, minutes later or even days later or weeks later. Along with echolalia is scripting. Um, that's whenever you're repeating exactly what someone just said or um, and this is more reciting actual lines in the sentences where echolalia could be a word or a sound. Scripting is um, you could remember it or say it right after someone else said it. So for example when someone when a teacher says students you need to clean up your toys um, a student with autism could go clean up your toys and then they could repeat it or kind of say usually usually the ending words of what a teacher is saying and then verbal rituals so a verbal ritual is something that the child often says and they could say this uh, at least once a day multiple times a day or even multiple times within an hour or a minute um, and it's the same thing so there's a video on YouTube about a child with autism doing a verbal ritual and he's saying don't say Tigger, don't say Tigger over and over again so that would be his verbal ritual. Um, these can happen for a number of reasons sometimes as a way to express an emotion or a want or a need um, sometimes just their idea of communicating to someone or at times um, dealing with anxiety in a certain situation so it would be used as um, they're stimming for a sensory um, difficulty. Along with that is touch. Um, sometimes they do not like it when other touch others touch them because of their hypersensitivity. And other times they're constantly wanting to be hugged or scratched or snuggled or rubbed. Just depends on the child. And you really have to know your children well in all aspects of education, but especially when dealing with children with autism because they do um, differ so frequently with different sensory um, likes and dislikes. Along with that is taste, 
lunchtime can be a difficult time. They might not eat much of their food because of 